semantic semantics is an alternative to truth condition semantics. It is based on the fundamental assumption that the central notion, to, notion in terms of which meanings are assigned uh, to certain expression of our language, and in particular to logical constants, is that of proof rather than truth. So the idea is to replace the primitive notion of truth with another notion, that of proof, and uh, use this notion of proof in order to explain how we assign meaning to certain linguistic expression and in particular to logical constants. And in this talk, I will focus on logical constants even more. I will focus on logical connectives, so propositional connectives, easy thing. Oh, easy, but not so much as we will see. Um, but, well, the proof theoretic semantics, uh, and as Peter says, uh, is, a, is a also inherently inferential, it, as it is inferential activity which manifests itself in proofs. So, the idea is that when we write down a proof, we are um, making some inferential activity, okay? And uh, uh, in, in particular, as he says, it does belong to inferentialism. Inferentialism is, let's say, this uh, uh, philosophical doctrine according to which inferences, and in particular the rules of inference, establish the meaning of expressions. In contradistinction to the, notation, the notationalism, according to which the notations are the primary uh, sort of meaning. So, again, you see the difference uh, that uh, was already kind of uh, settled here, the idea of saying, well, in the standard truth conditional semantics, uh, you define the meaning of the connectives, uh, saying, uh, uh, explaining when, uh, according to the truth condition of uh, certain sentences in which the, this connective appears, and uh, when you go down to the, uh, not to the connectives, but uh, to the proposition and the sub-propositional terms, you then use the notion of denotation in order to establish the notion of truth. In proof theoretic semantics, uh, on the other hand, you start from the notion of proof and then you enter into the notion of proof and you say, well, but the proof, in fact, it is a series of steps of inference. And so then what you take as uh, the primitive part is a rule of inference. Okay? So I will not enter here into what is a rule of inference. We will see uh, examples of rule of inference uh, in a while. Because there is another element uh, typical of proof theoretic semantics. That is, uh, uh, well, this general, as Peter says, this general philosophical and semantical perspective merged with constructive views uh, which already originated in the philosophy of mathematics and especially in mathematical intuitionism. So, usually, proof theoretic semantics is linked with a constructivist uh, theory of uh, logical constants, of meaning, of mathematics. Because uh, the idea is that, well, when you are a constructivist, you want to say that uh, uh, something is true because it's true because of a proof, in terms of proof, okay? And not because there is uh, some outside world that is there and, uh, um, how to say, uh, establish the notion of truth, establish what is truth or not. So it is us, with our inferential activity, our proof activity, that we establish the truth of the proposition. And not only the truth, what we say in proof theoretic semantics, it establishes also the meaning. Okay. Well, if we take this last part, that the idea that uh, at least original uh, proof theoretic <coughs> semantics goes with a constructivist approach. Well, starting from this, it is kind of easy to uh, enter a little bit more into proof theoretic semantics. Because if we take inspiration from, okay, I take it for granted, uh, you know what is the BHK explanation of logical connectives, but the BHK explanation of logical connectives, BHK stands for the Brouwer writing Kolmogorov, okay, explanation of logical connectives, and it is a way of explaining the meaning of a logical connective, or what is a logical connective, from a constructivist point of view, that is exactly uh, through a notion of proof. Okay, so for instance, you say, what, what is a proof of uh, a conjunction, a conjunction of the form A and B? Well, a proof of a conjunction A and B, it is a proof of A together with the proof of B, that you take together and you, you put together, okay? Uh, good. Now, if uh, proofs, this notion of proof, is formalized within the framework of uh, what, in logic, we call Gensel's natural deduction, then, 
Well, sorry, uh, I didn't say one thing before. Sorry, I will say, taking inspiration from the BH case, relation of logical connecting, then proof theoretic semantics rests on the idea that we know the meaning of the compound sentence. I use the example of A and B. When we know what counts, well, not just a proof, but a canonical proof. Of it. So the standard way of proving uh, disconnecting. So clearly, from the constructivist point of view, there is this idea that. Uh, you can prove a sentence in many different ways, but this is a canonical one, the one that established which is the meaning of the context. Now, if proofs are formalized within the framework of uh, against a natural deduction, then a canonical proof of a sentence A, well, is nothing but what? A close derivation ending with an introduction rule of the main connective. This is because uh, in natural deduction, for those who are not familiar with, uh, you have uh, uh, two kinds of uh, rules. Rules for introducing a, an expression, a connective in this case, and rules for eliminating it. Okay? So, this is the way in which it is, uh, it is written. So, standardly, in natural deduction, against a natural deduction, you do the opposite of what you usually do in Hilbert system. In Hilbert system, you have axioms all the time, you have just one rule, one Here you, you switch, you have only rules. Only rules of reference, and, and, and no axioms, let's say. Well, now, if we take this point of view of saying, well, a canonical proof is something that we explain in terms of uh, introduction rule of against a natural deduction, then this means that uh, we assign priority to introduction rules because it's the one that establishes the meaning of a connective, and uh, these rules are taken for granted uh, as self-justifying. Okay? And it is on that basis that the corresponding elimination rule should be justified. So the idea is that we, we take our um, introduction rule as self-justifying in the sense that we, we lay down and we lay down in a certain way because this is the way in which we explain the meaning of the connective. Then there are other rules that you can use, and you want to show that also these other rules are correct. And what you do, you try to justify them in terms of the elimination rule. How? I will say in a second, but first, let me say that this way of proceeding, so giving priority to introduction rule, rules, corresponds to a particular form of inferentialism, of these doctrines uh, saying that uh, well, the meaning of the connective is given by the inference rules, that is usually called verificationism. Why verificationism? Because the idea is that uh, the introduction rule tells me how I should verify that the assertion of a certain complex uh, or compound uh, sentence is done. So, it is done correctly if it has been uh, asserted in the direct way that means uh, through the introduction. Otherwise, it is asserted in a non-direct way and we should show that we can eventually assert it in the, in the direct way, but uh, doing a process of justification of uh, the non-canonical or non-direct way of uh, asserting a certain contract. On the other hand, you could have decided to start from the elimination rules, if you want. And in that case, what well, we speak of another form of inferentialism called the pragmatism, because in this case, the idea is that, well, you manifest your way of understanding the meaning of a connective by showing uh, that you can draw the, well, by manifesting it, by drawing inferences from the assertion of a connective. So, the verification is tell me which are the conditions for making an assertion and introducing into the play of our, let's say, language of our discourse, a complex sentence with a, a certain main connective. On the other case is that you start from the assertion of this compound sentence and you try to draw the consequence from it. Okay. Okay. So take uh, this for a while uh, in mind because we will come in a second. Now. Uh, one of the person who developed and he also the person who introduced this uh, terminology uh, verification as a pragmatism is Michael Dammett. So let's say that uh, inferential is, is now, is today a, a big discipline in the, in the theory of meaning, um, a big area, and there are many, many approaches. We can speak, for instance, the approaches by Robert Brandom, by uh, Pravitz. But, but Dammit was probably the, 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 the first of uh, starting this process. And Dammit considers two conditions that the inference rules of a logical connective must satisfy in order to be 
be fully justified and thus completely determine the meaning of a connective. So the idea is that, as we were saying before, uh, you can uh, uh, use this inferentialism uh, approach in order to explain the meaning of whatever um, uh, linguistic expression, or at least this is the Demetian project. But it works particularly well for logical connectives because, according to Dahmen, you can fully justify uh, the other rules that are not the rules of, of, uh, of uh, the rules of introduction, and then to say that the meaning of a connective is completely justified by its rules. In another case, let's say, imagine that we are not working just with logical connectives, but we are, uh, I don't know, in uh, specific mathematical or uh, scientific theory. It could be that certain centers, let's say atomic uh, centers, it is hard to justify them completely inferential. So it could be that the part of the justification comes from uh, a truth theoretic theory of meaning. I don't know. So in that case, you don't completely determine the meaning in terms of the inference. In this case, the case of logical connective, yes. Without, uh, I mean, we are not too, too, too much uh, surprised of that because, uh, uh, in a certain sense, uh, logical connective are things that are uh, topic neutral. So uh, they do not depend on a particular uh, world, on a particular uh, uh, state of affairs. And so we can think that we can justify it just uh, in terms of our uh, inference use. Okay? And here in this talk, I will concentrate then on uh, logical connectives. Now, these two conditions that Ahmed uh, asks for uh, showing that uh, um, a certain connective is completely determined, so its meaning is completely determined by its inference rules, are the condition of harmony and of stability. Now, harmony is the condition which received uh, uh, the most of attention. Uh, if you look at the literature on proof theoretic semantics, everyone speaks of harmony, and uh, there are many, many different views of uh, capturing exactly what this condition means. But uh, let's say that when the inference rules governing the meaning of a connective are formulated in terms of Gens and natural deduction, as we said before, well, this condition can be formally, formally captured by what is called the Pravitz inversion principle. What is Pravitz inversion principle? Well, is the following. According to this principle, the idea is that what can be drawn by the elimination rule for a connective C this is a connective whatsoever, an angular connective C, should be no more than what can already be drawn from the premises allowing the application of the introduction rule for C. Notice that here I'm taking the notion of premise in a broad sense, in the sense that when you have a schematic presentation of a rule in natural deduction, for me a premise is whatever thing that stands above the inference line. So it is not just a formula, it could be the fact that the formula depends on another, like in the case of the implication introduction. Usually, people speak of grounds in this case. But I don't want to speak of grounds because this is <laughs> something that could open a very many discussions, so I just speak of premises, okay? And uh, harmony can thus be seen as a sort of no more or no gain condition. And uh, notice that uh, uh, this interpretation of the no more or no gain condition holds also if we interpret harmony in another way, so not in the sense of uh, an inversion principle and a private, but in the sense of conservation which is another way of understanding uh, harmony, but it can still be understood as a normal condition. But in the case of uh, the uh, inversion principle of Kravitz, it can also be formally captured by an operation on proof of proof transformation or of derivation transformation, which is that of the tool reduction. Well, what is a the tool in natural deduction is the fact that you have an introduction rule who introduces a complex sentence uh, with a some connective C as principal connective, and then you immediately eliminate it. So it's a detour because you introduce and then you immediately eliminate. So you make a sort of detour. And harmony is the fact of showing that this detour is a uh, really detour. It says that we can eliminate. We can bypass this detour. It's not essential. Well, what about the other property? The other property is the one that interests me more in this talk. Because uh, uh, Stability can be understood as the counterpart of harmony. And it can, can thus be seen as a corresponding to a no less or no uh, loss condition. Well, in this sense, we can formulate it as follows. 
what can be drawn by the elimination rule for a connective C should not be less this time and not more than what can already be drawn from the premises allowing for the application of the introduction rule for C. So, according to Dammet, uh, satisfying both harmony and stability is a way to having what? A perfect balance between introduction and elimination rule. So, the intro the, the, if you start from the introduction rule, the elimination rule are no stronger, no weaker than the, than the introduction rule. And if you do the other way around, you start from the elimination rule and you try to justify the introduction rule, then the introduction rule are no stronger, no weaker than the elimination rule. And so in this sense, for them, proving that uh, certain connectives satisfy both the harmony and stability is a way to prove that the verificationist and the pragmatist approach are not two rivals. Okay? But in this story, I will take the point of view of the, of the verificationist is the most used one. So I will always start from uh, um, introduction and then try to justify the elimination. But you can do the other way. Now, several attempts uh, to formal capture the notion of stability have been recently studied in the literature. I here gave a list. So we have the work by Kurbis, uh, Francis Zendikov, Francis himself, Jacinta Reed, Tennant, even if Tennant does not really speak of stability, but he speaks of uh, deductive equilibrium, that is a very similar property, and again. Here in this talk, I will focus on uh, two of these proposals, that of Jacinta Reed and that of Tranquil. Why on this? Well, not only uh, these two proposals are prima facie very similar, and so one of the points of the talk is to try to separate them and show in which sense they are different. And on the other way, well, they are the two most uh, general proposal that uh, exists in the sense that the other can be subsumed under these two. Um, and moreover, they involve a, a, an operation of proof, of proof transformation. And in this sense, we can compare stability to R. Okay, in order to enter into uh, the, 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 uh, the core of the, the talk, well, let me say that uh, uh, in this talk we will analyze uh, uh, these two, pro two proposals and we will compare them with respect to a specific case study, which is that of quantum disjunction. And uh, this is indeed the connective considered by Dammet in order to discuss the failure of the stability condition. Now, which are the rules for quantum disjunction? Well, they are the following. So, let's start from the introduction rule. You have two introduction rules, okay, which are exactly the same introduction rule as uh, the standard introduction rule for disjunction. Then you have the elimination rule, which is very, very similar to the elimination rule of standard disjunction, with a difference. There is a proviso, and the proviso is that no side assumption has to be present in the subderivation of the two minor premises of this rule. In the sense that here I could have a derivation from A to C, but I, in order to apply this rule, you don't have to have any side assumption here. So no gap for who uh, see th these things in the schematic. And the same for this uh, minor policy. Okay? So you should derive C just from A and just from B, and no other things. Okay. Um, now, first thing to remark is that the rules of quantum disjunction are harmonious. And this is something that you can uh, uh, already see in Dammet. I will not enter into the detail, I just give the idea is that you could create a detour of this form. Here I choose to, to create the detour using it the first of the two uh, introduction rule, but you can do the same uh, with the other. So you have the two because you have an introduction that introduces this uh, uh, complex formula, and then this complex formula is uh, immediately eliminated. And how it can be reduced? Well, it can be reduced in this way. So you take the derivation d of a, and you plug in over the derivation d of a. I use here the square brackets to not, this is Pravitz's notation to say, oh, maybe there are many occurrences of A. And so I can plug it, uh, there, there could be multiple plug. Okay. Now, it is uh, harmonious, but not only Dammit, but also Jacinta Reed and Tranquini show that uh, these ru the rules of quantum disjunction are not stable. Okay? So this is a particularly interesting connective because it is harmonious, so it has good properties, but not enough in order to, be, to, to have a meaning that is completely justified by the rules uh, uh, of inference. Well, in fact, 
the thing that I read uh, in their paper of 2017, uh, well, it is a very, very rich and refined paper in which they analyze four alternative formulations of stability. Uh, here, we will focus only on the one that they call generalized local completeness. Okay? Uh, we will see later, maybe, if we have time, why they call it like that. Uh, here, we will call it uh, JR stability for short. Sure. Okay, but what I call the instability is just what they call generalized local completeness. They have other uh, proposals for formalizing the stability, but I don't need to treat them. When the instability is applied to the case of quantum disjunction, well, which is the form that it takes? It takes the following form. It says, assume a, con uh, a point, that is, a formula C is derivable from the premises of the introduction rule for the quantum disjunction from A and B respect. So, in other words, consider that uh, if you have that uh, S is a certain system of rules, in which we have at least quantum disjunction, but you could have other thing, uh, then you can derive C from A and possibly a certain context gamma, and derive C from B and possibly a certain context gamma. This means basically that uh, you have two derivations like this, okay? A derivation from C from A and from B. And here, it could be that indeed there are also some side assumptions. Uh, okay, I don't need to put the side assumption here just because it will be easier to read in comparison than uh, read the Jacinto uh, proposal and Tranqui. But if you want, we can uh, add it. But uh, it is just that I think that uh, they just make confusion for them. Now, so they, they assume something that is this condition, and then they ask to respect to other conditions. And the first is that you have uh, that C should be derivable in, uh, in the system S from A uh, quantum or B, okay? And uh, another thing, that this derivability result shall be established, or must be established, by applying a disjunction uh, elimination for quantum disjunction on these two derivations that you have on the assumption, okay? So you assume to have these two derivations, then you say, what is uh, for uh, a quantum disjunction to be stable? Is that I should derive the same C that I derived here from A or B, or quantum B, and uh, that this derivability result must be established in this way. So through an elimination. Okay? Why? Because this shows that whatever things that follows from A and C, which are the graph, let's call it the graph, uh, the premises A and B, of the introduction rule uh, for uh, the quantum disjunction must follow from the elimination. And indeed, it is the case. Sorry, here there should be a, a, a bar. I forgot it. OK. Now, it can be argued that since gamma is not necessarily empty, the proof configuration 2, that means this one, well, cannot always be obtained since the application of the quantum disjunction elimination would not be a correct. So in particular, there would be a situation in which we have the assumption, the point one, that is true, but the point three, that is false. And so the condition does not hold. OK? Good. Let's give concretely this counterexample. We can consider a language in which we have a quantum disjunction and uh, uh, disjunction and conjunction, the standard conjunction, OK? Then uh, we take gamma as uh, just the formula E. Okay? So it is a symptom in this case. And then we take C to be E and A quantum disjunct B. Okay? We have then that uh, from A and E, we derive E and uh, A quantum of B. And we do the same from B. Okay? In particular, uh, we have this two derivation. Now, what does the uh, condition the JR stability condition ask. Ask that I should be able to apply a quantum disjunction elimination rule here to these two, because these two are special instances of these two. Okay? And uh, I should obtain uh, the same conclusion. If I do that, uh, well, I'm applying uh, the quantum disjunction elimination rule in a bad way, in a not correct way. So this configuration here is not, properly speaking, a derivation. Okay? And so, therefore, we must conclude that uh, the quantum disjunction is not JR uh, stable. Yes, but you can say, however, 
Well, we could also uh, show the failure of the JL stability for the quantum disjunction by showing the failure of the other condition, namely uh, the fact that uh, uh, this one, the fact that a certain C is derived from A quantum or B. In this case, well, you should have the, the point one that is satisfied, but you would have point two that is not satisfied. And so again, you have uh, the failure of the condition. How it works? Here, we take again gamma as E, but we take C as a different formula. We take it as E and A quantum or E and B. Now, uh, we have on one side that this formula here is derived from A and E, and it also derived from B and E, since we have these two uh, derivation, okay? Uh, on the other hand, by adopting the standard interpretation of quantum logic based on orthomodular, orthomodular like this, sorry, which is or was at the time the standard interpretation at the time of time of quantum uh, logic, it is possible to show that this formula is not at all a consequence of E and A quantum or B. So that, uh, since it is not a consequence, we cannot deny this thing. Okay? Now, the way in which uh, uh, Jacinta and Reed argue for the lack of stability for the quantum disjunction seems to follow indeed this second uh, counterexample and not the first one that I gave. They say this, the following thing in their article. They say, the elimination rule for quantum disjunction are not generally complete, uh, are not generally locally complete, so stable for us. E and A or E and B uh, is derivable from E A and from E B, even though the same formula is not derivable from E and A uh, quantum or B. Okay? So it seems that they, they are just speaking in terms of derivability, as we established in the second counterexample, not in the way in which we prove. Uh, or we try to prove this de particular derivability. Now, this is what I, uh, I say. So, why the first counterexample is based on the impossibility of operating a specific proof transformation? That of taking two derivations, applying the elimination rule, and obtaining a new derivation. The second counterexample only rests on a non derivability or unprovability result. But, wait a second, proof theoretic semantics takes proofs as the principal object of study, and not just as mere tools for studying the derivability relation for establishing probability results. So, as a Schrodinger says, proof theoretic semantics is interested in proofs and not in probability. So, in this sense, it can be claimed that the JR stability fails to, generally, uh, fails to be generally proof theoretic, as it does not always work at the level of proofs but it works instead sometimes at the level of their probability. Now, uh, more generally, if you want, uh, we can see the problem of JL stability from another angle. That is, certainly it is based on, a, on an operation of proof transformation. The problem is that this operation of proof transformation does not preserve the derivability context. Why? Because it changes the set of assumptions of the derivation involved in the, in the transformation. The idea is that the operation that they consider takes these two derivations as input and should give this derivation as output. Now, in passing from one to two, so from this configuration to this, well, we have the, con the, the, the fact that the context of derivability changes. Because in the first case, C, C is derived under the assumption A and possibly gamma, and under the assumption B and possibly gamma. But in the second, derivation, uh, C is derived under the assumption A quantum or B and possibly gamma. So you, uh, you change the set of my assumption. Thus, in order to block the transformation, well, it is sufficient to show that the derivability relation, that means the sequence if you want, considered in one old, while the derivability relation considered in two does not. But in that case, it is a, then a, a question of derivability, probability, not of proofs. Now, let me move to Tranchini account, and let's see the difference. Tranchini analyzes the stability condition in terms of what he calls generalized expansion. Again, 
If I have time, I will explain why he uh, calls it this way. But here, for short, we call it uh, T-stability. When T-stability is applied to the coin of quantum disjunction, it takes the following form. And you will see, it is very similar to the previous one, but with, this, with two big differences. Mm -hmm. It assumes, as before, that the formula C, A formula C, is derivable from the premises of the introduction rule of uh, the quantum disjunction. That means from A and B, respectively, as we had before. But uh, it adds another condition as an assumption. He assumes uh, that A quantum or B and plus uh, some possible uh, gamma allows us to derive C. So what he did, he moved uh, what was uh, a condition to be satisfied before to an assumption to be satisfied now. And this means that we clearly have this derivation. We assume to have this derivation of C from A quantum or B. Now, under these two assumptions, then it is required for this connective to be stable to satisfy condition 3. That is, that this derivability result here, that is taken as assumption, should be, or must be, uh, better, established by uh, applying the following proof configuration. Here it is the second difference. It is not exactly the same configuration as before, because now we ask uh, not only to apply the elimination, not only to apply to the derivation that we have here, but also to derive A or B from A and from B. Okay? Now that we have this, uh, well, we can see the fundamental difference between uh, the JR stability and the T stability. I already uh, mentioned that, let's see in details. It concerns the place assigned to point 2. In JR stability, 2 is part of what 1 is required to have in order to, uh, to satisfy the stability condition. While in the T stability is part of the assumption which, one, uh, which allows one to formulate the stability condition. And this is a crucial difference since by explicitly assuming that C is derivable from A quantum of B, one can now focus on how C is derived from A, qu A quantum of B. In this way, the stability condition is made to work at the proof structure level and not just at the mere probability level. In particular, what we have is that from the point of view uh, of T-stability, the second counterexample that we consider is no more and is not anymore a counterexample for the T-stability. So we, we showed two counterexamples before, and in the T-stability, only the first one works. The second one is not a counterexample anymore. Okay? So it is more restricting the certain sense of the condition. Uh, on the other hand, as I was saying before, the first counterexample still works. But let's see how, why it works. Again, we take gamma to be equal to C to be equal to E and uh, A equal to more B. Then we have, first, that uh, from, no, we have, that from E and A, we derive E and A equal to more B. We do the same thing if we change uh, A with B. And also, if we put A quantum or B instead of A or instead of B. In fact, we have the three following derivations that are perfect derivations, perfectly correct. The one that establishes that E is derivable from uh, E and A quantum or B is derivable from E and A quantum or B. And the one in which we just add to this premise, to this premise the application of the uh, introduction of the first one and the second one, and we get the derivability from A. But still, the condition 3 cannot be respected. Why it cannot be respected? Well, because uh, now, if we take uh, these two derivations, or better, sorry, these derivations, sorry, we take it and we plug it on the two minor premises of A or B, and then we apply the uh, the, 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 sorry, the disjunction introduction in uh, on the two cases, then here, again, this is not the correct derivation because we have the extra assumption E here. And so the quantum uh, disjunction elimination is not correct because this should not appear. Okay? So in fact, uh, what, uh, uh, here it is at play is that E and A or B is derivable from E and A or B but in a certain way and not in another. So here it is the case of how we derive things and not only that they are derivable. Now, 
The operation of proof transformation, which is involved in the t-stability, takes the following input. So it takes as input a derivability of c from a equal to b, and not from a and b. And it gives this as output. This proof transformation preserves now the derivability context. Because you see, here I start from a quantum b plus some uh, possible uh, extra assumption gamma. And in this proof configuration, they are exactly the same. So this is a proof transformation that preserves the derivability context. And it makes it analogous to the operation of the tool reduction which is also an operation which preserves the derivability context. In fact, when uh, you have the tool, you take a certain proof uh, D of C from a certain set of assumption gamma, and this brings to another derivation D star of C from a set of assumption gamma star, which is a subset of uh, gamma. Most of the time it is gamma, but sometimes it is a subset. But this is not a problem because, well, since the derivability relation is monotone, well, this means that there is no real change of assumption that is made. Okay? This is a subset that can be made by monotonicity. Well, this is completely different for an electron than before for uh, just singular ring, because in that case, they clearly change the assumption. It's not that one is the subset of the other. Now, the, 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 the two accounts of stability that we presented can be differentiated in the case of quantum disjunction only if the letter is analyzed in connection with the other connectors, namely conjunction. This is how we construct the two counterexamples. One thing that uh, uh, I argue, because as you have seen, sorry, I say it only now, but this work is made, uh, is a joint work with two uh, colleagues and friends, uh, Idenori Kurokawa and Mattia Petrolo. Well, if quantum disjunction is taken alone, well, we can prove that these two approaches behave in essentially the same way. Why this? Well, because uh, when quantum disjunction is considered alone, so without other connectives, without other rules, it can be shown that it satisfies both the J stability and the T stability. And the reason is given by the following result. I will not prove it, but I just mention. If you want, then we can discuss how we can prove it. Uh, so let's take a language which has only quantum disjunction and with the system of rules composed just by the rules of quantum disjunction. We can prove that if C is derivable in Q from some assumption, then this assumption is unique. It's unique not only the, the fact that uh, I have just uh, one uh, shape of assumption, but the assumption is really unique. I have just one occurrence of this assumption. Okay? Now, Let's, uh, let's show why the two both uh, satisfy uh, the, the, the stability condition. So, uh, suppose uh, that uh, uh, point one of the JR uh, stability is satisfied, so that we have uh, two derivations of this kind. The previous result guarantees that there is no side assumption, neither in uh, uh, D1 nor in D2. We can thus apply in a perfectly simple way the disjunction elimination. And so, Point two and point three are not satisfied. What we just said is already also sufficient to just satisfy condition one and two of the t stability. Why? Because if I have this result, I immediately have condition one and two of the t stability. And since in the configuration two, here, this one, the only assumption is of this form, it is possible to transform it into the two new derivation applying the disjunction introduction, the first one and the second one, and then respect also the T stability. Why? What we do is that just that we plug in here uh, an introduction for this junction. And so we have this new two derivation, and then apply again the disjunction elimination. And this is an instance of the uh, schema that should be satisfied uh, in point three of uh, the T stability. Okay, see, here I have the tool, but I don't care, because, I mean, the, the tool is a question of the harmony, not of stability. Okay. Uh, so this is satisfied, the T stability. Now, uh, do we have time a little bit more? I think you have, a, you can use a quarter of an hour. Okay, good. So I will try to explain why uh, Jacinta Reed called uh, their property General, generalized local stability and why uh, Tranchini calls it uh, 
generalized expansion. And you will see that this is a, a, an interesting point because we make again a point in favor of the tranquility. As we said at the beginning, the condition of harmony and stability are meant to guarantee a perfect balance between the introduction and the elimination for a given linear connective set. In particular, uh, we said that the idea is that if we take the introduction rule for C as primitive, as we said, in the, the, like it is the case in the verification of these by satisfying the harmony and the stability condition, we should be guaranteed to find the elimination rules for C that are neither stronger nor weaker than the corresponding. Now, a very minimal requirement, minimal, uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, weaker than stability, but it's minimal that we should have. For capturing such a balance is to have that, if we have that C is an NRE connective, and so we have N, uh, N formulas to which it is applied, and we have that C A of A, A of A1 AN is derivable from itself, no, sorry, a very minimal requirement is to ask that these complex centers, the centers that has the main connective, the connective C that we are analyzing, should be derivable from itself by using exclusively the root for C. So this is a minimal requirement because we made it that if we have been able to introduce it, well, we should also be able that starting from it, we reintroduce it. And this property is known in the literature as local completeness. Although it seems to be a very minimal requirement, notice that local completeness is not a trivial condition. It is not satisfied by all harmonious connectives. Let me give an example. An example is the one that is called a simple implication. It's a sort of a special kind of implication. It is discussed by Dambet, but was already introduced by Mitsu Okada in uh, the 80s. And it is a rule that has, well, a connective that has, as introduction rule, the standard introduction rule for implication. No, sorry, sorry. As introduction rule, not the standard, sorry. As elimination rule, it has the standard rule as elimination. But as introduction, it has a, a restricted introduction rule because it asks that here there is no side assumption. So you see, we are making a sort of similar connected as before. Before, we imposed a, a restriction on the side assumption on the minor premises of the elimination rule. Here it is imposed on the major premise of the introduction. So you should derive B only from A and not from other things. And if it is the case, then you can, uh, then you can uh, uh, introduce the implication. It can be proved that these rules are not harmonious. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, it can be proved that they are harmonious. In fact, uh, uh, well, you can even prove something more, that they are cut, uh, they, you have cut elimination from them. Well, cut elimination is a little bit more. In any case, however, they do not satisfy local completeness. Why? For the following reasons. Since the only licit means for proving local completeness for uh, this uh, simple implication are the rules of this implication itself, we are forced uh, to start with what? And we have, we have to prove. Uh, sorry, I maybe write the down. So. You, you, you should be able to derive A implies B from A implies B. So if you have to start from this, you should start from an elimination, right? So start from an elimination. But now, how can I proceed? I cannot do the implication introduction because uh, I have a context here. So I am blocked. So this connective is not locally uh, complete, but it is a one. Notice on the other hand that local completeness is satisfied by quantum disjunction. So quantum disjunction is a little bit better than this connect. <laughs> because you can derive A quantum or B from A quantum or B. Okay? Now just in the read, consider that their account of stability is a generalization of the local completeness condition. And this is why they, they speak of generalized local completeness. They require that the elimination rules for a certain connective C should allow one to obtain the same consequences C that can be obtained by the premises of the introduction rule for C, without necessarily restricting C to be of the form small c over A1 and A. So what I'm saying is that, uh, basically, if you want, 
this notation here is just a particular case of the of the schema that they are asking to be respected in order to prove the local copy. In fact, you have just to instantiate C with A quantum or B, and then use an introduction. But then this instance of the elimination is perfectly correct because there is no sign assumption. So that works. Uh, as I said, it is just a particular instance of uh, the proof configuration that they ask at point of the uh, uh, condition. However, no explicit reference to this particular configuration is mentioned in the JL stability. They are just saying, it is a particular instance of this. But I don't care too much of this particular one. On the other hand, cont uh, on the contrary, in point three of the T stability can be explained by making explicit reference to this condition, to the local stability, to the local components. Why? Okay, first consider the condition two, uh, the, the, the condition two that is the, the one of the two assumptions of the T stability. It asks to have the derivation of C from a uh, quantum order. Now, imagine that we take this and we plug over it the derivation that we have seen before. That one. Okay? This is usually called an expansion of three. Yes, because you have three and then you expand it on the, on the hypothesis. So that you, you, you replicate it a uh, quantum order. But now, from this configuration, you can obtain the configuration asked at point three of the T stability. How? By asking to permute this derivation D upwards on the two minor premises of the elimination. Because this is the proof configuration that Tranquini asked. But you see now that uh, the configuration asked by Tranquini is uh, something that can be explained in terms of two operations, local expansion and permutation of the derivation of the minor premises of the elimination. Notice that clearly here the problem is that in the case of quantum disjunction, this permutation cannot always be done because if I have a context gamma, then it does not work. Okay? So it works, but in some particular cases, not all the time. So, uh, following the Tranquini account, we can thus describe stability as the composition of two operations, two of, of proof transformation. One, it is an operation which expands the hypothesis of proof, and the other is an operation of proof permutation. And this corroborates for me the idea that Tranquini's account captures in a more genuine way the proof theoretic character of the stability condition rather than the simple Ritz account. Because, why? Because in a certain sense, I can have a finer analysis of this operation in terms of proof transformation operation. And also, it explains better why it is, in a certain sense, uh, a generalized local completeness or a generalized expansion. Uh, moreover, decomposing stability into two operations allows us to deepen our understanding of this condition. Why? In particular, because if we want to show that the, the rules of a connective of a certain connective are not stable, we have two ways of doing that. Either we show that the rules of this connective does not satisfy local completeness, and thus they do not allow to operate a proof expansion, as it is the case of the simple implication. Or we show that even if proof expansion is possible, it is the per proof permutation that cannot be executed. So, in a certain sense, I can say both the simple implication and the quantum disjunction are not stable, but for different reasons. I can explain why they are not stable. If they are not stable for a different reason. One because it cannot be expanded, the other because it, cannot allow, it does not allow for the permutation. Notice also that, uh, as it is formulated, local expansion concerns only the rules for a con of a connective at the time. And it is for this reason that the adjective local is used in order to characterize it. Okay, this idea that expansion is a local property is something that uh, I developed some years ago with uh, my, my, my friend and colleague, Mattia Petroli, in the paper. 
on the rather different topic, we call it the property deducibility of identicals, but for other reasons. But it's basically the same. On the other hand, the operation of proof per quotation involves a derivation D, which has to be permuted upward to the minor premises of the elimination. And this means two things. The first one, that in order to apply such an operation, the elimination rule must be in a generalized form. OK, uh, we can develop it later for the discussion if you want, uh, but uh, you can do the permutation only if you have uh, two minor premises in which you can make this permutation. And so the elimination rule should be in a generalized form. Now, Reed has his own way of conceiving what is a general elimination rule. Tranchini has his another one that is the one taken from, from Peter Schroeder-Meister. And the two accounts are not exactly the same. Uh, we can discuss it later if you want some details. The other point is that the derivation D can involve several groups, because it's a derivation. You can have many things inside, which can be different from those of the connective under analysis. And the permutation consists then in a global action operating on all the rules used in D. You are no more reasoning only just on the rules of a particular connective, but you can have many other rules of different connectives as it was the case for the, the, the conjunction, right? As I, we see, the problem with the rules of quantum disjunction arises indeed when the letters are considered together with the rules of another connective conjunction. Why? If taken alone, they are stable. Okay? So the fact that what I'm trying to point out is that, the local, uh, is that local completeness is really a local property. It concerns one connective letter. The other property, the property of permutation, is something more common. Now, this is something just to tell you where we are trying to go with uh, my colleague and friend uh, Ide, Ide Naoli and uh, Mattia. Is that this is the analysis that we made in natural deduction. But in fact, we can go a step further and try to analyze this in sequence calculus. Why? I explain you in just one slide and then I stop. So if we pass to the sequence calculus side, the operation of permutation can be treated in a, let's say, more local way because we can use a special rule for uh, speaking of it. That means the rule of, the, of cat. The cat is a way of composing two proofs, and then I can study how I reduce the cat, and the reduction of the cat can involve uh, what corresponds in natural deduction for permutation. More precisely, the possibility of operating a proof permutation corresponds to the possibility of reducing a specific kind of cut. In this way, it is possible to have a homogeneous treatment of harmony and stability, as they can be both understood as formal operations involved in the cut reduction process. Harmony would correspond to the operation of reducing a principal cut that is a cut in which the two cut formulas are both principal and coming from a logical root. So I have, for instance, a cut in which we have one formula that comes from a C introduction rule and the other from the, sorry, from the C right rule and the other from the C left rule. And I can. And this is a, 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 eliminating this cut is proving that. But stability would correspond to operation of reducing a particular kind of non-principal cut, namely a cut in which one of the two cut formula is not principal, so it does not come from uh, a rule of a connective, uh, but it is a part of the context. And uh, it, it is the conclusion of an identity derivation. What is an identity derivation? A derivation of a sequence of the form uh, like that. So for instance, uh, I don't know. OK, so a particular identity derivation of this is uh, uh, this one. Oops. Here it is. That, uh, sorry. The right rule, right rule, and left rule. Okay. And so the idea is that I cut here. Okay. And the idea here is that in order to 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 eliminate this cut, what would the idea is they have to let push it up. And this is the permutation. Moreover, sequence calculus would allow us also 
to define another property which we call the dual of stability because in fact instead of cutting on this side we cut on the other side and so going through sequence calculus we can even be more refined in our analysis of the property of stability well in fact uh, you can do this uh, you can analyze also the dual of stability in natural deduction that is a more complicated affair because you should have a dual inversion principle but we can discuss later if you want. so that's basically my presentation so to wrap up it was for showing that this property of stability was well, really complicated you have to look at some details and according to the way in which uh, you analyze it you can uh, give rise to two different uh, uh, account of stability very similar but in fact not exactly the same and one of them at least for me the one by very tranquini is more proof theoretical in spirit than the other and then what i try to say at the end is that since it is really uh, the one by tranquini an operation of proof transformation well if you want to look in details what are these proof transformations maybe it will this worth also to go on the side of sequence calculus in order to have a more refined view so that's all thanks a lot Okay, so we have plenty of time for questions. Maybe short break? Yeah, we can take a short break in five minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Euh, voilà, si vous êtes, euh, si vous suivez euh, cette, euh, if you follow this presentation online, please feel free to uh, ask a question if you want to. Uh, no, no, we we can waiting for Kevin before we can resume. Uh, okay. So um, we can now turn to the discussion. So who wants to start? Okay, well, I mean, I, I, have, a, I, have, a, I have a question. That I, so it's a very, um, very basic question about the, the, the two counts. Yeah. So you, um, you've, you've convinced me that they are like obviously different accounts and they have different merits and there's one key example in which they diverge. But um, you could say also that the, the divergence is, is just about one reason for, uh, uh, I mean, there's just one case that, so th there's one account that, that for a particular connective, mm -hmm. there's <coughs> one counterexample that is neutralized mm -hmm. by Tonkin's account, mm -hmm. but both accounts give the same verdict about quantum disjunction. Mm -hmm. So what you've shown is that they, um, so they differ at least like intentionally in the mm -hmm. sense that mm -hmm. they give a different reason for why uh, quantum disjunction uh, is unstable and they have different explanatory properties mm -hmm. and you may I, I agree with you that the, the, the trunk in your account is more fine-grained in some sense mm -hmm. you, go that, you go more to the, to the structure of proofs than the, the other one and I, I didn't completely grasp why it was not like completely proof theoretic but at least it has some it gives some, it gives, it give, like within the, 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 this is perhaps for another question, but the first question I wanted to ask is, do you have an example of uh, a connective that would be classified as um, unstable according to one account? And unstable, so, uh, so. No. And, because uh, you, you, you prove, so you gave a, you have a result to say that when in the case, in the special case where there's <coughs> the quantum disjunction, they are, they are, so my question is, is it the case that, is it, perhaps it can be proved that they are extensionally equivalent in okay. general, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a good way to show that they are not extensionally equivalent is to give an example of a connective that yeah. is stable. And so, the, yeah, so do, should you expect that they are extensionally equivalent um, or not? I expect that yes. Okay. And the, the problem is a problem of uh, how do they show that something is not stable. But my guess, but this is a guess, I didn't try to uh, prove it in Zeno, mm -hmm. that they agree on saying this connective is not stable, and this uh, it is. Because, uh, yeah, I think that the, the only but this is a, I, I studied on this case, mm -hmm. I don't have any other case in mind, but what I showed is exactly this, is just that the Jacinto read is a little bit broader, so you, you can generate uh, more counterexample than the other, but whatever counterexample is by Tonkin is also this. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that uh, they are they are equivalent. Um, in fact, uh, um, they have also, so I said at the beginning that they have uh, uh, that there is something in which they can be maybe differentiated. That is uh, uh, the kind of general elimination rule that they use. But on this, I'm not an expert, and I don't remember, but I think that uh, um, in the case of uh, Jacinta and Reed, uh, the general elimination rule for conjunction is different from the one by Tranchini, but this does not create any problem on stability just create on uh, how you write down a proof, but uh, then at the end you do the same thing. So again, it is a problem of, of the style of something, but not on the, on the essence of the result. So no, on this I think that they, they would agree. Yes. Okay. Well, okay. Okay, good. So, in fact, all the the, the 
the difference on the style of the connective, you will see when you go to a sequence calculus. Mm -hmm. Let's say that in natural deduction, distinguishing the style of the, the connectives is rather difficult because, well, uh, you don't have uh, explicitly the structural rule. What does it mean really to have the structural rule in sequence calculus? It's more on the discharge rather than on using explicitly weakening or something. These are the properties of the derivability relation. Mm -hmm. So if you go on sequence calculus, okay, then I can say something about that. Oh, there is the reason. Just one second. Um, let's do we see one thing. Then I can mm, show you this also in the case of natural deduction, but it's a little bit more complicated. So let me start from sequence calculus. Um, Sequence calculus, imagine that we um, translate what I said for stability, but uh, in, the in, a, in the case of the quantity on the connective, the T stable. So standard disjunction. Okay? Okay, we take standard disjunction. Standard, what does it mean? <laughs> because when we are in natural deduction, well, let, let, let's do the same thing that we said before. So I start from A and A, so from two identity sequence, and then I apply the same rule that I used before. So I use this uh, right rule here, oops, and the other right rule here. And then I make my elimination rule. Uh, sorry, elimination. Oh, but why I wrote, yeah, the, the left, sorry. Sorry, I was mixing up Okay. Now I have my proof of uh, identity. What is making an expansion of a proof of uh, gamma A or B DRC? C? This is like uh, the one from which Franchini starts, okay? And then you, if, you, if you compose them, so if you put a cut uh, between them, you are kind of expanding this proof with something else, okay? And we have this. Now here, I argue that what is uh, stability is the fact that I can permute this cut upwards with respect to the uh, uh, left rule. In that case, the natural deduction, the elimination rule. Okay? Uh, and this I can do because here I have the standard uh, the disjunction, so I don't care about uh, the fact that this is uh, empty or not. I can always do. Okay? But uh, Wait a second, here I'm not using any structural rule at all. So in fact, if you look, this is not just a, a uh, disjunction whatsoever. This is editing disjunction. If I use the linear logic style of writing, right? Good. Now, what about the multiplicative disjunction? Hey, look at the moment of how you write down the identity proof. You put it right down in this way. The first thing that you do is that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, second of this gap. Uh, okay, so I am, uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. I immediately write it uh, in the linear logic style. Pa. Okay. Opa. And then, uh, so this is pa. Ah, it's a little bit. Sorry. Oh. Plus. 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 This is pa left, pa right. And now. Okay. Now here, if I cut on this side, then I cannot do a permutation because I cannot go up with respect to this. But I could do on the other way. I could I cut on the other side. Now, yes, I can move upward the cut with respect to the right <coughs> one. Because what happened is that I change the left with the right and the right with the left. And this, for me, is what is called the dual of stability. 
So the dual log stability is in fact in, induced by the fact that uh, I have different kind of expansion and according to the uh, order of the room that I give, they select me a connective. And then uh, I can do on one side or on the other depending on which is this order. So you have that what would be dual would be plus and uh, the tensor, and what would be uh, sorry, stable, stable, what would be plus and tensor, and what uh, and the dual of stability would be uh, para and weight. Uh, and so, in a certain sense, what I'm claiming and what we are claiming with Ida and uh, Mattia is low stability, if you look at it in a proper way through sequence calculus, you can even justify, in a certain sense, <laughs> Uh, why you rise up uh, on, on the linear logic. So it is a, a separation of the style of the connectors. In fact, um, you can do the same in natural, in natural deduction. But in natural deduction, you have to give me the second of looking at uh, some notes because it's not, uh, um, I don't have in mind like that. But in fact, in natural deduction, you, have, uh, you can do the same by applying what uh, Sara Negri in a paper called uh, Varieties of Linear Calculi, Calculi, uh, she, sorry, if you give me just one second, I'll read you. She introduced uh, what she calls a dual of the inversion principle, and she formulates as follows. Give me one second. He, she says, uh, sorry, I don't have this in mind, yes. Whatever follows from a formula must follow from the sufficient ground for deriving the formula. So, to say in another way, is that uh, you uh, would get, for instance, uh, if you take, uh, okay, if you take the plus, you get this. That the introduction rule would be something very, very, very strange. Because would be this, the, the introduction, huh? one. So you introduce, but in fact you eliminate the And uh, if you go and you look, uh, and, you, and you keep the same elimination. You can do the same and have uh, form, uh, rules of this format for the power. But for the power, you must be also multiple conclusion. That's one thing that, uh, OK. Usually, I don't like too much multiple conclusion in natural deduction, but in case you can do. And then you show that stability is permuting upwards with respect to the minor premises of the elimination rule. And the dual of stability is permuting upwards with respect to the major premise of the introduction rule. So, in a certain sense, you can recast what you have in sequence calculus, but you have to change the shape of natural deduction. And I think that this is a very, very proper way of uh, dealing with the style of the connecting in natural deduction. But uh, you have this strange uh, rule of introduction. And for me, wh wh why it is the problem? For me, there's only one problem is that uh, when you, sorry, if you, if you give me one second, I'll show you how it is, for instance, the natural deduction rule of introduction for the pair in uh, Sarah style. She would have uh, something like that. Let me just a second, yes. Yeah. The problem is this, is that you would have A, B, gamma, and something like that. So it means that you have multiple conclusions. Now, my problem with multiple conclusion is that, uh, strictly speaking, uh, from a proof theoretic point of view, if you accept the idea that the rule, uh, uh, that in a rule, the, the, the formula appearing in the rule, in fact, are a formula that are asserted, it is rather difficult to say what is a, an assertion involving more than one formula at the time. I mean, when you assert something, you assert one thing. 
What, what, what would that mean to, to assert a, 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 a set of uh, sentences? Either you use this direction or you know, the, the standard the problem that you have with multiple conclusions. Well, in SQL calculus, you can go for, for a different uh, justification. You say, well, maybe I abandon the idea that uh, I'm also using the rules for explaining the meaning. I'm just using the rules for defining a constant. That's all. So maybe I put aside a little bit the question of meaning. But that's another history. <laughs> that is more complicated. The status of the SQL calculus. OK. Actually, I, I'm, I just want to follow up on this, if, unless someone has a question. Uh, I have a question to a very broad one. We can put that later. Perhaps I missed something, but what, what is the... So could, we, could you really say more about the, how, you, how you think the status of multiple conclusion in a SQL calculus? For me, personally, when I move to SQL calculus, I have the... My, my way, way of understanding SQL calculus is that SQL calculus is a, a calculus for studying the relation of derivability. Mm. So it is a sort of uh, formal setting. So in that case, I'm no more sure that uh, I can uh, uh, extend all the proof theoretic semantics project to SQL calculus. Okay. Maybe I can, maybe not, but it is hard to think. Because in natural deduction, it's clear what is the interpretation that you give to a, to a, to a derivation in the natural deduction. Or at least, if you give an interpretation in terms of assertion, which is the interpretation that I like to give, mm. because it's linked to the use. So mm. imagine that uh, when, when you write down uh, something like this, uh, is that from the assertion of A, I assert B. After I assert A, I assert B. So it is not just. A play, something on which I play on formula. They are interpreted things and interpreted, uh, and then I can uh, um, have a linguistic, uh, how to say, um, action on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In SQL calculus, uh, this reading is much more complicated. Oh, there is a lot of literature. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. But, uh, and so if I go, and this is something that I didn't say in my talk, but if I go on the SQL calculus uh, side, mm -hmm then maybe I should change a bit of project. It's not completely proof theoretic semantics. It's defining logical constant using proofs rather than, uh, uh, let's say, truth or denotation or whatever. But it's a semantic thing, or it is just a, a more formalistic uh, way of defining connectives in a setting which is not model theory, but it's proof theory. And that's all. Mm -hmm. Which is a kind of a different project. You know, maybe the notion of meaning is put aside. Maybe. I mean, we can talk about this later, but there are people who think that uh, uh, sequence calculus is, a, is actually a good framework for proof theoretic semantics, like Pauli. Yeah. Uh, so you have to disagree with Pauli on this. I mean, that, that's uh, just to clarify the position. I'm not saying yeah. that uh, no, it's right. No, 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 I, I, right, but just to, have the, to understand my, my why it's My feeling is that when I go on, uh, on the side of SQL calculus, but this is maybe my personal way of mm. things, is that uh, then I, I go on a different project and I can find maybe again, something that goes on the, theory, on the side of theory of meaning, but changing. The meaning would not be given by a reading which is a reading, an assertoric reading or things mm. like that, yeah. but would be, I tell you what, a computational reading. So the meaning is given by the, the computational operation that I do. And computational operation are not necessarily assertive okay. operation, or assertoric, linguistic. That's how I really put it. This is another problem. Yeah, no, but that's more. <laughs> <No, laughs> that's that's no, that no, that completely clarifies no. uh, the, 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 the that, that, That's why here, that, then you have, as I tried to say in the slide, that not the sequence calculus would maybe have a more homogeneous reading of all these operations because they are linked to cut, to cut elimination, to cut reduction. But then you should give an interpretation to the cut reduction. And if I give an interpretation to cut reduction, that then would allow me to give a theory of meaning on it. 
of the basic theory we know, then I would give a computational reading of cut reduction. That means execution of the problem. And then I could have another project that is okay, yeah. a, a definition of the theory of meaning based on uh, computational operation. Let's say. Peter? Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for a great talk. Um, I especially like the, 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 the last slide, the, 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 the suggestion for the homogeneous treatment. Um, I personally haven't worked so much on stability, uh, more on harmony. Um, it, it's a more natural uh, like phenomenon or a, you know, criterion, I guess, uh, to me at least. Mm -hmm. uh, and I failed to, in fact, uh, see the intuition or something behind um, stability in general mm -hmm. um, and why um, this would be so harmful uh, for a theory of meaning um, if we have unstable uh, connectives. Um, is there some kind of a point where it can go horribly wrong? Uh, uh, okay. Like tonk, uh, yeah. uh, yes, caused by stability only, yeah, uh, and not harmony. Yeah, you can have. This is Damet that uh, speaks of that. Uh, if you take, for instance, uh, uh, conjunction, standard conjunction, mm -hmm. and uh, and the quantum disjunction, and you add the standard disjunction, you could prove uh, something that uh, a, a something in the older language. So conjunction and uh, and um, sorry and and uh, ah, quantum disjunction uh, that was not provable, provable uh, at the beginning mm. and uh, uh, so you have non conservativity results basically yes. and why in fact for a reason that maybe blocking it with stability is asking maybe too much huh? because you could block in fact the problem is given by the fact that uh, you don't have uh, uh, in a natural reduction derivation what is called uh, a permutation reduction. So sometimes uh, you have uh, uh, an introduction and elimination of the same connective that are separated by an elimination rule of another connective. If you permute, uh, like the permutation that I gave, you can recreate the cut, eliminate the, 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 sorry, the detour, and eliminate it. But if you don't have the permutation, you could have some sort of hidden detour. Mm. So uh, the fact is that, uh, in a certain sense, uh, if stability is, uh, you, you can see in two ways. Let me put it like that. You can see. Well, I can ask just harmony. But then, since I ask harmony, usually in a system, I don't just ask that I reduce locally a detour. That I have uh, the whole normalization theory. Mm -hmm. But in order to have the whole normalization theorem, usually you ask also to have this permutation reduction in order to explicit the detour that were written by an elimination. Mm -hmm. So you can say, okay, I go from harmony to normalizability, and normalizability must go with the permutation reduction. Or you can do another way, and then you stay just on harmony in a certain sense and generalize it. Or you say, no, I have harmony. And then I ask stability, and stability is this expansion plus permutation. And if I have permutation, then I can also uh, have all the good detour uh, that I should have. So it is two ways of uh, looking. That's a, that's a very good question for you, because in a certain sense, you could just say, I don't have stability, and just to generalize my notion of harmony, and to, to push it through normalization, full normalization, let's say. Mm -hmm. So yes, in a certain sense, yes. And that's why I, I, I try to, to show you that you can kind of analyze stability into two different things, expansion plus permutation. Permutation is uh, the complicated stuff. And permutation uh, makes a lot of things appearing or not appearing, like producing new cuts or not, new, new detour or not. So it is, uh, in a certain sense, more global than one thinks at the beginning, yeah. But yes, yes. But in fact, the let, let, let's say in this way. The fact is that, OK, if I want to be more precise, you could ask harmony, or better, normalizability, 
and normal invisibility in a full sex. So with the permutation reduction. Even for system that has general elimination rule that are at the end not completely stable in the sense of tranquility. I gave you an example. So the standard rule of introduction for implication. So here no restriction on the context. And you have as elimination rule, a general elimination rule, so that allows you to make some permutation. Uh, that for instance. which is usually called the flattened general elimination. Here, I could have some derivation here, for instance, and push it here. So I can prove what is usually called permutation reduction in a normalization process. But this rule is not stable in the sense of tranquility. Why? Because uh, Imagine that we make an expansion first. And this we can do without any problem. Oops. Oh, sorry. I tried to give the same notation. Sorry. And then I, of, of the proof, so I started from this proof. I expand it to an elimination introduction. Now I'm asking, can I push this thing up? The problem is no, because I'm From, from where it comes, this guy, this say here. Oh, OK. Maybe an introduction uh, without uh, any hypothesis. OK, good. Let's try to do that. And then I discharge this here. Let's see. But I remain with A, that I cannot discharge. So these rules uh, allow for every full normalization. But they do not allow for ever this kind of stuff. And they have full normalization because in this case, the full normalization would mean that, uh, as Tennant says, the major premise of the elimination rule stand proud. In the sense that a normal uh, de derivation uh, in uh, using general elimination rule would be a derivation in which the only hypotheses are major premise of the elimination rules. So that would be normal, but it would not allow to have uh, this property. So in a certain sense, stability is, is uh, even stronger than uh, asking for full normalization, if we understand full normalization also as permutation reduction. Yeah. We don't want strong criteria, right? We want as weak as possible criteria. Ah, in, 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 in the case, I think uh, here, damn it, they want the strongest. Uh, because you want... Uh, well, the strongest would be that someone just accept classical logic with the usual rules, and <laughs> that would mean your connectors are strong. No, but in, uh, in a certain sense, what they would like to have in this case is that you would like to have that you set your, your introduction rule, and then the elimination rule should allow you to derive no more and no less than what you can derive from the premises of the introduction rule. Uh, this is very mm, strong, but why it is so strong? Because they would like that in this way, you see, it is no more and no less. It is like having really a definition of the connect. The connect is, is exactly this thing. It's exactly, um, how to say, captured by the, the, the rule and by nothing else. But I see the intuition behind that, but I have the intuition myself that 
one should be get a bit uh, loose from that definition. One is in French list and, and say, well, uh, there is something being done with some rules. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's apparently coherent. I mean, it, it doesn't yep. lead to it's conservative. Let's say. Yep. Um, so um, why not just uh, 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 think that there is maybe some meaning inside it, uh, even if it's not a definition that is. Ah, uh, I see, I see. But I think uh, that this is exactly. But this is my personal understanding of the pro of the proof dynamic semantic problem. Is that they want to ask this in the case of logical constants. In order to say logical constants are exactly those expressions for which I can give a definition in terms of uh, infinite inference. Maybe there are other expressions for which I cannot ask this thing. I should ask less harmony, normalization, and I'm fine. Then uh, it is what happens usually with mathematical systems in which I can ask a mathematical system to be harmonious in a certain sense of the sense of I reduce uh, the cut or I reduce the de tube. But I cannot ask more. Or better, well, in some particular cases like arithmetic, if you write uh, the introduction uh, rule for an elimination for the predicate uh, to be a natural number, the predicate n, and you write them in the style of Martin Love uh, inductive definition, how you can get something uh, that is both harmonious and also stable, but stability then could create some problems. That is maybe too strong in some cases. But hmm. So then it depends from the mathematical theory. But let's say if you are in, I don't know, projective geometry, what you ask is just to have uh, that the system uh, reduces uh, the tool or uh, eliminates the cut. <coughs> Yes. Yeah, locally, yes. Okay. But in fact, in fact, the way, sorry, then I can say one thing, and why Trantini wants to have uh, Peter Schroeder yeah. as general elimination is because in Peter Schroeder as general elimination, you, to say two things, it would be this rule. Uh, okay, now I have to explain. What is this double arrow? The double arrow is whatever rule, whatever rule that allows me to pass from A to B. So, and here you discharge or you disactivate not only formula but rules. In fact, in better solidarized point of view, formulas are uh, trivial uh, rules in a certain sense. So everything is a rule. And in this case, then you would write your derivation in this way. Let's say A. I use my rule A of B that allows me to pass from A to B. And I will write here. And here I disactivate, sorry, I again do this. I disactivate here the rule. The rule. And then here I disactivate the formula with the introduction. So then we become the expansion. And then if you put the derivation here, you can permute it upward. Why? Because we do that this. like that, uh, they discharge a derivation, they say. They, they do, this, do something like this. Discharge. No, sorry, this is OK. This is not, not they say, they, yes, they, they, they discharge this thing. Uh, I prefer the other notation by Peter. Uh, but, uh, but it's the same, and you can do exactly the same. So that's the difference. So you see that uh, stability also allows to make a difference with respect to which style of general elimination rule. 
Do we take the flattened one? Do we take the other one? The higher order one? Maybe the higher order if you want stability. Are there any other questions? There can be questions about the, like the general project of proof theoretic semantics, about the big picture. If you don't want to dwell too much on the technicalities, this is also like a, an opportunity to uh, discuss these things. Sentences is to know, to have an, a notion of the canonical proof, mm -hmm. and I was surprised about that. Why, why is it important for the meaning ah. to 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 go for okay. the canonical? Good, because this I think is very much linked to a constructivist standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a constructivist, uh, you think that uh, well, things should be explained in terms of the construction that you make. Now, let me take an example which is not from uh, logic, but from geometry. Uh, in geometry also, when you introduce your uh, uh, figures, you have a canonical way of constructing things. So, for instance, in Euclid 1, 1 you have a canonical way of constructing an equilateral triangle. Even if you can construct in other ways. But you should be able, for the constructivist, to show that there is a standard way for making this construction. Okay? Because it's the deconstruction that explains what is this object. Mm -hmm. What is a canonical tri a, an equilateral triangle is uh, the thing that I construct in that way. And then all the other I explain by saying I could have constructed in that way, in that way, in a canonical way. Uh, so here it is basically the same thing, is that I want to explain what does uh, means to me a conjunction. Sure, I can use uh, uh, in my language and during a discussion, I introduce, I introduce, I use a conjunctive uh, sentence many, in many different ways. But then I should be able that, to show that when I introduce it in the, in, during the discussion, I should do it in the canonical way because this is what explains me what is really the uh, conjunction. And it differentiates from another connect in a sense. So it is the, the, how to say, if I want to recognize uh, uh, the difference between, okay, I, 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 I say in another way, let, let me do this. Um, mm. uh, I don't know if my example is wrong, but uh, imagine that uh, you have an implication. You have an implication. Uh, you have a derivation, blah, blah, and then you have an NA here, and then you can let enter into play B and C. But you can let enter into play also B or C in the same way. And in fact, you want to distinguish these two because they are not the same. So I must find a way in which I say, oh, but if I introduce it this way, then I should be able to introduce in the canonical way, that means passing through the conjunction introduction. Because uh, that uh, would distinguish me this from this. Because in this case, uh, I would introduce just with one of the two. So it's in a certain sense a way to say how I can really say that is a conjunction and is not another connection. But, but still, yeah. I'm puzzled because yeah. I understand that you want to be to have this power of distinguish. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But still, how how should I understand the alternative proof for a certain connector in a meaning in a in yeah. a semantic? Okay. That would be a proof that uh, allows you to say that. Sorry, I just because I know that you are not see. No. Um, if you have a proof which is not canonical, is something that you would say, well, having a non-canonical proof is enough uh, 
to show that something is true, but it does not explain me yet why it is like that. And the why comes from the normalization in this other sense, and the fact that I can canonize it. Okay. I would put it this way. I use why, which is a yeah. plenty of implication, but I would say that yes. So sometimes a non-canonical proof is part, is, is a, I would say, a sort of incomplete thing. It, it tells me something, but uh, I expect that it's canonizable in order to fully justify my assertion. So, for instance, if you ask me, okay, um, show me that uh, B or C is uh, true. I give you a proof of B or C, whatever it is. But uh, I expect uh, that uh, in order to show that it is really a proof, and it is correct, I should be able to normalize it. So it is a way of showing that not only what I give uh, is sufficient for giving you the truth, but it uh, really gives you why it is like that. Yeah. The why, maybe I don't know if you want to see it in this way, but yes, why not? Why not? <laughs> okay. Why not? So, yeah. Yeah, I would say like this, yes. That uh, a proof that is not canonical could suffice to. to to show the truth of the certain sentence, normalizing, canonizing it uh, is being sure that the sentence is also meaningful and then it is real too. That uh, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, a witness of this true that is a false witness in a certain sense. Okay, uh, but in that yeah. sense, you're you're going up. You're going farther from the verificationist notion of traditional that you seem to be attached to in a certain sense. Because there's no particular way to verify something. If you verify it, it is, it is true. Ah, true is verification. And here, true is proof. It's doing something. So, yeah. so I'm puzzled about this canonical still. Ah, OK. <laughs> Ah, uh, I can say in another way. But I like your why, but it's not verification, it's something else. Um, I'm trying to find if I have another example in mind to, to, to go on this, but uh, maybe there was questions, so maybe the. No, I don't know. Um, but that's okay. Um, Okay, because, because uh, okay. Um, because I, in a certain sense, uh, you give me something and say, oh, it is a proof of this. I want to verify that it's really a proof. Mm -hmm. And to verify that it's really a proof, I cannot ask. Okay. So because can, uh, otherwise I cannot say that it's a proof of B and C. Well, it could be here formulated that I wrote B and C. But I pass from this, so I'm not sure that I can really transform into this. If I don't transform into this, I'm not sure that it's really of the form B and C. Okay. Um, it's like... Uh, so if you built a triangle with another means, you're not sure it's a triangle of that type until you transform yeah. it in a case. In a certain sense, yes. It is a way to, to check that it's really the object of the kind that I declare. Yeah. So if you want, in terms, of, in terms of programs, you see it very well. So you could have that you say, well, I have a program of a certain specification, B and C. Mm -hmm. How can I tell you that uh, the program does what it declares? Mm -hmm. I, I have to transform my program into something of this form. A pair. A pair where P1 is of type B and P2 is of type C. And I'm sure that it does what it can. Now you know. So, uh, yes, in a certain sense, I, I, I would say this. Let, let, let me put in another way now I have the right way to say it. 
Uh, having a proof is something that guarantees you the truth. Canonizing it guarantees that I know that it's true. Maybe I'm taking this from Martin Luther, in a certain sense. It's a sort of a, a transposition of what Martin Luther would say, but it's something like that. So bringing to canonical proof is a way to know that it's true, not only that it's true. Yeah. I have a question. Um, yeah, the, the big picture and going back to the first slides. Yeah. To clarify with the, the dialectic. So we have we have this verificationism and pragmatism as, as two rival views. Yeah. And then uh, we say, well, if connected charge are more is unstable, we can show that they are not really um, competitors, that they are mm -hmm. compatible. But I was trying to find a, a very simple example. So if I want to introduce my in my calculus a connective that, that is like conjunction but without one of the eliminations, that's clearly not stable. Yep. Say A comma B until it's A or B and A or B can only infer A. Yep. Um, okay. Not B. Okay. So it's harmonious, it's not okay. stable. Good. And and then I was thinking, well, and then, and then what? Then what about the initial uh, discussion? This does uh, give, um, if, I, if I want to, to have this corrected, I'm giving arguments to verificationism, to pragmatism, or it's just that, well, that well, you if have you to choose yeah, between one or the if, other. If you started from the conjunction, from, from the introduction, sorry, mm -hmm. and then you say, well, <coughs> And then I add my, my, my elimination, which is a sort of uh, stricter than the usual one. The reply would say, well, the elimination is not correct, so try again in a certain sense. This is not uh, enough in order to define a connective uh, just by, by means of its rules. Is it enough for you? Yeah, okay, yeah? So, yeah. Then stability could be as strong as harmony in the sense of forcing us to yeah. be close to the connectives. Yeah. Um, okay, that's. But you, you could have done the same uh, by saying no, but I take a point of view which for me are the elimination first. Uh, and then you start from an elimination and you say, oh, well, is this uh, introduction that I try too strong, uh, less strong? And, and then, in case of you check, so you have to check again. Uh, Harmony and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and conservativity. And sorry, conservativity and sta stability. So, then clearly, and that's uh, why I was uh, also speaking at, at the end of uh, so these things by Sarah Negri. So, that is, uh, well, one, one, one big problem here is that uh, sometimes in the uh, inferentialist uh, um, discussion, Lacks uh, the uh, the discussion of uh, how should be an introduction rule if you start from introduction rule, because here there is something strange. You start from introduction rule, and then asking uh, uh, this question of stability tells you that the elimination rule should be in the form of generalized one. So you are saying something on the elimination, but you didn't say too much on the introduction. I'm just kind of saying, oh, it's something that should have some hypothesis, and then I have, in the conclusion, my main connect. But what happens when you have, uh, I don't know, for instance, uh, rules for uh, a modality like uh, the modality of probability logic? Try to put them into uh, natural deduction. You would have that the box appears in the premises and in the conclusion. Or try to take, I don't know, um, a modality for the belief uh, connected. And again, you don't have really an introduction and an elimination. So, in that case, what do you do? What, what are you starting from? What are you trying to justify? So, there is very, very few things that are telling us from where I start. And what is an introduction and what is an elimination and an elimination. I don't know too many words on that. Now it says a chapter a little bit in his book. He says something. Uh, there are some works uh, telling us, uh, yeah, sure, uh, you should be, uh, what, what is it, the, 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 the principal uh, 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 separation of connectives. So there are properties, but you don't have a general format of what should be an introduction. 
And now someone who tried Pravitz tried to give a general formula, but it works for something. And if you want to let that into the bits or modalities, that's very hard. So in general, I think that here we learned something of the elimination rules, but still it lacks something of the introduction. I have one question to start of curiosity. Um, there's a couple of times that you um, almost said the word grounding, and then you, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, and then the, when, when this discussion with, with Alexander yeah. was going on, uh, the why yeah, was yeah. approved <laughs> also went in that direction, and uh, like I have the feeling that you that you want to say uh, uh, no, uh, no, no, but it grounds. It's not just proof, it grounds. No, the fact, the uh, fact which is a kind of semantics that we try to uh, no, I know. Here. The, the fact that <laughs> it, uh, it is that uh, it is pretty. It would be. So it is helpful sometimes to use a notion like ground or saying that something uh, explains why something is true. Or that. But then I don't want to use the term or try to use it the less that I can, or to say I use it but I forget it, because then um, I should explain in which sense uh, they are used and maybe construct the theory. Yes, yes, yes. Clearly, Pravitz is someone that is trying to do that nowadays, and he uses uh, the notion of grounds uh, in an explicit way. Um, but uh, it is kind of complicated. I don't, I, I'm not in the setting of Pravitz. Maybe I could, uh, even, even Martin Luther has some of this uh, terminology in a certain sense, but using a kind of different way. So it's more on, it is something that founds uh, the knowledge or something like that. So as I was saying, the fact of normalizing and getting the normal form is because they, not only it is true, but I know that it is true. So I have, uh, in a certain sense, uh, founded my knowledge. I have something that tells me uh, that I know this. I, but uh, uh, it would be hard, because then it would be not only to have a theory of meaning, but also a theory of knowledge based on that. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther has it, but it's rather complicated to explain how it works. So. I want to not to say too much. But yes, the, the, the fact is that I would say Martin Luther not only say that you have a theory of meaning based on proof, but clearly a theory of knowledge. Or a certain kind of knowledge at least. Yeah. The project we try to develop here like tries to put the notion of ground first. I see. And then reduce and then try to develop a semantics and a proof theory afterwards. Uh, but, but well, like put the full meaning should be in the grounding theory, and uh, then you can see the links with other proof theory and other I see. semantics, I see. Uh, like for functional semantics. Um, it, well, I see. results are promising so far, but uh, uh, it's like uh, you want to use it all the time, uh, and then you just say, "Oh, we do it." It's, it's, yeah, yeah. That is where no. we put the meaning. <laughs> I see. No, I see. Uh, that's interesting because on my side, uh, which is the, 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 the thing that I'm dividing with not alone, but also with Mattia, Thomas Eiler, and other colleagues, is not going on grounds, but we, we made a, another decision. We say, no, we go on a sort of formal level, we want to speak of programs, and we do philosophy of computer science from this. Mm -hmm. In the sense that uh, instead of having proofs, uh, we have something, how to say, um, a little bit more, more uh, um, a notion of uh, more, more liberal than proof, which is the notion of program, because not only all the, not all the programs are proofs, but certain programs, those that are certified are proofs. And starting from that, we try to reconstruct the notion of proof, the notion of uh, logical constants, and that stuff. But we made a different thing: is we let aside all the theory of knowledge, all the theory of meaning, and we just do. Theory of computing, <laughs> which is maybe easier for us. <laughs> but uh, yes, but I, I, I see the similar thing to, to start from something a little bit broader, I think, mm -hmm. and then try to recast the notion of proof with some properties that then uh, from uh, the, 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 the starting notion, adding properties. Of I like the program uh, way of, 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 of thinking about this too. 
so I, I, that, that sounds also like a very interesting uh, project that we were describing. Yeah, we, we, we are trying to do that, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think that we have less border than uh, try to even have a capsules a notion of, of knowledge. But I don't know. We, I, this is our maybe maybe we, we have been too dismissive in a certain sense. We should have tried to be more broad. <laughs> That's from where we come in a certain sense. We come from linear logic, so that was uh, rather normal to go yes, yes, through you know yes. all the carry out stuff and that uh, that way of well, I think we are actually on time. Thank you. It's four. So we can thank our speaker. Thank you.